Um, tonight's speaker, uh, Matteo Cassini, is lecturer of Renaissance and Mediterranean history at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He has also taught in Venice, Padua, and Florence, and elsewhere. And he has been fellow at, at many distinguished institutions. Um, my first encounter with Matteo was many years ago in the mid-1990s when he was a fellow at the Warburg Institute. And we have got many of his off prints with handwritten dedications to the Institute on our shelves. Um, and some of them are presently able to for loan um, here in London. Um, the next to these um, stands his, uh, his book, I Gesti del Principe, La Festa Politica a Firenze e Venezia in Età Rinascimentale, which he published in 1995. Among his most recent publications, and there are many, um, is an article on sugar sculpture, which despite of its brevity, and in addition, in addition to its focus on Venice, lays the ground for further work on sugar sculpture in early modern Italy in general. Um, tonight, Matteo is going to speak um, about a society on show, state processions in Renaissance Venice, 1495 to 1600. Thank you, Matteo. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Eckhart. Uh, my shifting to my presentation mode, uh, and uh, meanwhile, I would like to really thank thank you and uh, and the War Book Institute um, for inviting me here. Needless to say, I have uh, great memories of my staying here, and I wish to to be back uh, as soon as possible in this. Uh, current difficult times. We share now my screen. Here we go. All right, can you sit? Yes. Secondly, I of course have to, to do kind of an obvious uh, methodological introduction, which is uh, we use um, a lot of images tonight that are not coming strictly from the iconography of the processions, of course, uh, but I'm not an art historian, so I'm not particularly an expert of those images. But uh, as well, although scholars and uh, festivals uh, know that it's very interesting to inquiry the circulations of themes or subjects uh, uh, between uh, the, the civic rituals and processions uh, and festivals, uh, and of course, other sections of a culture of a city. I think it's a pretty familiar thing for all of us that we are studying festivals. In Renaissance Venice, the main state processions were extraordinary festivals circling St. March Square, the heart of the Republic. They lasted hours and the participants were hundreds, if not thousands. According to some sources, the most important events had an attendance of 70 to 80,000 people. The square, the front, and the inside of the Basilica of St. Mark were adorned with very rich and meaningful decorations, standards, tapestries, golden silks, and other rich upholstery. All the participants were required to participate at their best of their possibilities and dignity. The route of the procession was from the Ducal Palace to the Church of San Gimignano on the other side of the square that we see down here, and then back to the church, entering in particular from the door of St. Peter here. Here we see other possible uh, adding of the, uh, of the procession, but we might talk about this later. Confraternities and the regular secular clergy appeared in the first part, before the Patriarch of St. Peter of Castello, the head of the Roman Church in Venice, and when present, the Corpus Christi. And carried chariots of mysteries and figures represented by funeral hard books and live acts. And here in this print, actually, we have down here a very interesting uh, small representation of these chariots called Soleri. The highest classes followed in the second part, surrounding the true charismatic center 
of uh, <clears throat> the parade, the Serenissimo Doge, in a precise hierarchy. In these parades, the acts of religious devotion were intertwined with civic splendor and political, social, and cultural symbolism, with great results for the image of the most serene republic. An anonymous uh, French pilgrim wrote uh, in 1480, for instance, that some marked processions displayed, quote, the whole triumph and wealth of Venice, and there were all the processions of the city at the highest estate. I will consider here basically two kind of uh, state processions in St. Mark. First of all, the processions that were a regular part of the city calendar, such as the Corpus Christi or the Palm Sunday. In particular, the Corpus Domini was established as outdoor celebration in 1407, and the procession found, after a series of laws and events, some stability and regularity since the 1450s. Second kind of procession, the so-called procession of crisis, decided for extraordinary circumstances, such as international events, leagues or wars, or internal events, natural disasters, play, plagues, or earthquakes, etc. In particular, the great parades celebrating international events are of interest of the chronicles. Even if the Eucharist was absent, they were very similar to ordinary processions, at times even better, in fact. The full range of participants was attending, for instance, while in the civic calendar days, it was not. And here, of course, we see the very known uh, um, painting about uh, by Paolo Veronese of the Battle of Lepanto, which, as we will see, it was, of course, um, an event uh, that was uh, celebrated a lot in Venice. And, and on the right, uh, the Madonna Nicopea of the Church of St. Mark, that was carried sometimes in the, in the square, you know, in particular in case of natural disasters. Among the procession of crisis, the first in the period covered by this paper was the Palm Sunday procession of April 1495, in honor of the International League against the invader of Italy, Charles of France. The available documentation tell us that it's the first example of the Renaissance triumphal model of the Venetian state procession. Then the sources enlighten other procession during the Italian wars. In March 1499 for the League with France, in October 1511 for the Holy League with Rome, Spain, and England, in May 1512, the League with England in March 1513, the League with France, September 1515, the arrival in Italy of the King of France, July 5th, and July 1526 for the League of Cognac. Later, around the mid 16th century, there was a sort of void, possibly also you know, because of the lacking of the sources. But in this period, we have the spectacular print, uh, the procession of the Doge by Matteo Pagan, released uh, possibly around 1561 and composed of eight tables with rich details. And I want to uh, thank so much uh, here, uh, my friend and the librarian uh, uh, of the Marciana, Ursula Braides, that uh, recently showed me um, a, a great uh, copy of a uh, great print uh, of, uh, of the, the procession by Mattia Pagan, uh, uh, published by the Bassano brothers Remondini in the early 19th century. And I will show some uh, picture taken from that uh, edition. Um, it's, it's a very long uh, procession, uh, up to four meters long. Then great processional events restarted in July, October 1571 for the Holy League and Lepanto, of course. And in 1576 and 1577 for the plague and the new feast of the Redeemer. A particular subsequent occasion was in June 1585 when the visit of four Japanese monks saw a most relevant procession after the difficult moment of the 1570s. 
Finally, another great parade uh, happened in July 1598 for the Peace of Bervin between Spain and France, uh, and incited a very interesting period of the Dogado of Marino Grimani, as we will see. And here, of course, I, I brought uh, the famous print of the procession of the Holy League, uh, a later 18th century representation by Gravenborg of the Japanese, and actually one of the pamphlets, one of the few pamphlets that were released uh, for these occasions uh, uh, by Gio Giovanni Luigi Colli. All these processions are punctually narrated by many sources, chronicles, such as the famous diaries of Marin Sanud, of course, letters of foreign ambassadors, pilgrim travelogues, books of ceremonies, laws of the government and other official records, printed pamphlets of the late 1500s, mostly as we see here, iconography and other. I will divide my talk in two parts. In the first part, uh, I will, you know, sort of use an anthropological approach and I will look uh, more closely to some of the single participants to the procession, which is something that has not been done very regularly, but uh, I think it deserves a lot of surprise. In the second part, uh, I will shift to a more cultural approach, if you want, and I will analyze some of the most important themes, uh, subjects, uh, uh, particularly expressed by the Soleri, the chariot of the grand schools, the confraternities, uh, and even other participants. Let's start for, for, with the first part. As mentioned, the first part of the cortege belonged to religious organizations such as the confraternities and the clergy. The confraternities were the very well-known five scuole grandi, the grand school, the wealth institutions devoted to patronage and building on a notable scale. In particular, the leaders of the scuole grande came from the cittadinanza originaria the original citizenship, an upcoming second order of the social hierarchy of Venice, a sort of middle class after the patriciate that remained pretty close during the Renaissance. The cittadini saw the leadership of the scuole and the processional participation as a great opportunity of affirmation inside the society. And uh, um, Bellini here is representing in particular the segment of uh, St. John uh, the Evangelist, the school of St. John the Evangelist. And as many of you know, this was part uh, of uh, a cycle of different paintings devoted to the school. However, the Squale Grandi had also poorer members that in the Middle Ages had joined the confraternities by acting as flagellants. Now, in the 1500s, the rights of flagellation were dismissed and those members' participation gave problems to the government, as well as the grand schools in general, in fact. A series of laws were released because of lateness, indiscipline, and neglect, competition, and fight for precedence in St. Mark. All things that could damage the dignity of the sacred event, according to the authorities. Interesting fact, other components of the popolo excluded from the upper society had almost no role in the state parades. Just a few of the hundred minor confraternities, the Scuole Piccole, were requested not, to, not really to participate, but simply provided the cortege with some, some silver doppieri, the two branched candlesticks. The hearts were absent as well as other important figure of the populace, the Arsenalotti, the worker of the arsenal, who instead had a fundamental role, as we all know, in the right of passage, in the rights of passage between the old and the new doge. And here I just brought a, a couple of photos of the Squale Piccoli, the Squale dei Mercanti uh, on the left, uh, and the famous uh, schools of the Slavons uh, in Castello, actually just uh, in front of my house here, with a wonderful cycle of Vittorio Carpaccio. Down we have an also very famous uh, image of an important uh, rite in uh, ritual in, the, in the, the square of San Mark, uh, in which we can see the Arsenalotti defending uh, the doge, uh, throwing coins uh, to the people. Going back, so, absence uh, basically of these uh, components of the society in the state processions. 
Going back to the processional order, the grand school were followed by the monks of the main orders, such as the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and Capuchins. And the priests are the nine main congregations of churches and the chapter of the quarter of Castello. The monks in particular were in high consideration by the Republic. And in 1606, in the Corpus Dominus procession during the so-called interdict, a contentions between Venice and Rome because of the Jesuit order, the two orders of San Dominic and San Francis were exhibit helping the Doge to sustain the current Venetian church. However, the monks did not always have a pious processional conduct showing wealthy chariots and dressing very expensive copes and sandals, at times adorned with pearls. Therefore, they were a source of scandal sometimes, in particular for pilgrims. After the clergy came the central segment of the procession, the segments immediately preceding and following the doge, who, even when the Corpus Christi was present, was perceived by the Venetian as the real charismatic center. And here I would like to open a parenthesis. We should discuss how, not just in Venice, but everywhere, the, real, the charismatic center was perceived, in my opinion, but those who was considered in some way the servants of uh, the, the prince and followed by, instead, by those who were considered the peers and we see clearly this in the Dogal procession, and in my opinion, as, as, as I saw even in other places such as Rome and Florence. So a sort of a convergence uh, towards the charismatic center. The segment uh, before the docks, and here we see, of course, the nobility and the patriarch. The segment before, uh, sorry, we see the entire um, Dogal segment in the upper part uh, from Bellini. The segment before the Dukes uh, was of his servants and comprised his heads, such as the personal squires, the canons and patriarch of Castello, interesting that uh, the patriarch was here, from the local patriarchate, but obviously linked to the Pope, the canons of St. Mark, uh, the personal of the Basilica, which was the center of the Venetian church independent from Rome, and peculiar figures such as the Grand Chancellor and the members uh, of uh, the Ducal Chancellor, they, in particular we see here. Here I want to, as, as a work on, on, this, on this order, I want to just mention a couple of things. The secretaries came from the same cittadinanza originaria, the same order that I already mentioned, the upcoming middle class. The Grand Chancellor was obviously the Chancellor leader, and the literature of the myth of Veni described him as the most important representative of the population excluded from the nobility. Gaspar Contarini, one of the great uh, you know, builder of the myth of Venice, says that he is the head of the most honor of the secretaries and calls him the doge of the people. And that is why he has to proceed so close to the Serenissimo. It was basically in front of the doge, as we can see here in this nice detail of the, of the procession. And then after, short left the door here on the right, we see the secretaries. Keep in mind this image, we will see it again. And on the lower screen, I, I brought a, a nice picture from a, a French treaty of the 1510s uh, showing the signory of Venice and the secretaries just uh, under it. Then the doge followed in gold and white silk gowns. This was uh, normally the dress uh, for the parade, putting in display the charisma of the Republic, but also his personal one. When the doge Agostino Barbarigo had his solemn entrance in St. Mark during the 1494 Corpus Domini, according to the pilgrim Pietro Casola, quote, a great silence came up. He looked as only one person could govern all things, obeyed but everyone without resistance. And the capacity of the doge to symbolize the holiness of the Venetian Republic was all in the richly decorated dogal hat, the famous corno dogale that we see here on the right, 
that went with him in the ritual exit from the Ducal Palace and was exposed with the treasure of St. Mark during Easter and the Ascension Day as a sacred relic. Also, in fact, a very well known other special triumphal insignia surrounded the Duke when he walked outside the palace. Eight banners, six silver trumpets, the chair, the pillow, the sword, the round baldachin, and a white candle. They are very well known, they studied, and they all had a high symbolic significance and a complex story, mostly deriving from the narrative of the Peace of Venice in 1177 between the Emperor Barbarossa and Pope Alexander III. Opa. Here we go. Just to mention one example of how, how these insignias were perceived, the French Jean de Tournay compared the golden baldachin carried on the doge to the baldachin above the corpus domini in French processions. The supreme head of the Serenissima, therefore, was seen as in direct contact with God. Then followed the doge's peers, as I told you, after, after the doge, First of all, the ambassadors or preeminent, preeminent guests. They could be near or with the doge or could simply watch the procession from the ducal palace or the procurator again uh, around the square. As Eleonora Gonzaga, just one example, the Duchess of Rubino did in 1518 and 1527. And here they are very well represented also by this other small uh, print uh, inside actually a map of Venice uh, of the late uh, 1500s, and here on the right upper right uh, on the on the on the left. I'm sorry, we have other details from the Mattia Pagans uh, uh, procession. Even the Turkish ambassadors that we actually see here down here were, would assist the parades, sometimes hiding behind a window, sort of scared. Other times enjoying the shows or even criticizing it, in particular, the chariots of the Holy Testament. Finally came the Venetian Patriciate according to the rank and age. In this section of the parade, the number of participants could easily reach 200, with a significant attendance of senators well-dressed in golden mantles and crimson and scarlet vests. A particular role was held by the Cavalieri della Stola d'Oro, the Knights of the Golden Strip. These nobles belonged to a sort of informal order in Venetian society, as they had received a title from a foreign lord, not from the Doge. The order of knightship in Venice uh, given by the Doge was the, the Cavaliers of St. Mark. They often dress entirely in gold in the cortege, with the strip of the vest, the typical Venetian beret, called becchetto and luxurious golden necklace. Sometimes they would carry the umbrella over the Eucharist during the Corpodonis procession. And in 1598, six cavaliers carried a very rich umbrella over a miraculous image of the Virgin of St. Mary that was crossing St. Mark. Because the Eucharist uh, in other occasions uh, outside the Corpus Domini were very often substituted by the other important sacred images. So the, the, we see here two images of the, the Knights of the Golden Ship from the 18th century um, images of uh, Grevenbrock. Notwithstanding their precise and prestigious appearance, though, all these protagonists enacted a harsh competition on the procession, a processional stage, as they all cared a lot about their honorable, honorable positions. The Dugan cortege had to reflect, as Clifton Geertz has written for the 14th century Java and 16th century England, quote, the world that the world should imitate. Disputes regularly arose between schools, young and old patricians, the patriarch and secretaries, the cavaliers and the grand chancellors, foreign ambassadors, religious orders, magistracies, etc. In April 1519, for instance, there was a great disorder and confusion at the entrance of St. Mark during the Holy Thursday because of the fight between the schools of St. Mark and the school of St. Rock. 
Candlesticks were broken and even weapons were taken out as the Council of Ten wrote. And from the 1510s, uh, this I brought uh, the image of uh, Saint John the Bat, uh, Evangelist, uh, and uh, on the lower side, uh, from the 1510s to 1561, the secretaries of the Ducal Chancery, especially the most important of them from the Council of Ten and the Senate, were able to steal the processional place of the Patriarch of Castello, replacing him near the Grand Chancellor, so the Grand Chancellor, and therefore getting closer to the Doge. And he actually, I just put in uh, an image from Bellini, and here we can see that the patriarch was actually, at that time, at the end of the 15th century, proceeding near the Doge. Uh, in, 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 the, in all the subsequent uh, uh, iconography after Mattia Pagan, uh, we can see instead that we see the, the, the Doge, the, the Grand Chancellor, and then immediately the secretaries and the patriarch after that. There were precise laws that uh, allowed this change by, by the secretaries. An attempt of the patriarch to reconquer the old position that was actually rejected. And this was exactly in 1561, which actually gave us a, a very interesting date for the Matthias Pagan procession. And talking about participation, so to conclude, the Venetian processions, as every civic creature, were not immobile at all, as sometime I heard. Talking about participation, we ask also to make, we have also to mention women and the gender issues. According to Berlin's procession and other sources, such as Sanura and the iconography, women of the high classes could assist to the Corpus Christi procession only from the windows of St. Mark's Square. A German visitor, Corwin de Grunenberg, quote, did not see marching any rich women or girls, but just saw the burgers' wife, interesting, the burgers' wives, women and girls, watching from their windows. Only thing, is noticed their faces were unveiled, contrary to the common use. And here I have to open a parenthesis because in fact, women were actually allowed to get inside some mark to assist to the mass of the parades and they had special banks reserved to them. Also the civic calendars gave them a few people of public occasions every year in which they were the real protagonist. The most important was the night of the Ascension Eve, when they were reserved the exposition of the spectacular treasure of St. Mark and the relic of the blood of Christ on the Basilica's altar. However, we know from the pilgrims that in that occasion they were a source of unrest. They had difficulty entering the basilica and taking place because of the very high shoes, the famous Venetian tall clothes called Pianelli or Chopins that we see here on the right. Here I capture on the upper side on the right a very interesting detail of Giovanni Bellini with a very tall woman entering the basilica. And uh, of course, uh, in the lower side, there are the famous uh, Pianelle from the uh, Museum uh, Correr in uh, Venice. <clears throat> and they would start shouting and making disorder at the arrival of the Doge doing a lot of uh, mess when the doji would come in, as is actually happening today with the movie or rock star getting into the street and meeting the fans. But luckily enough, women could also have a much more serious role in the parades, being part of the various, uh, um, or the various representations of the solari, the, the, the processional chariots. Between 1511 and 1526, uh, women in procession acted as the peace, the mercy, and fortune. In 1585, two young girls were dressed in jewels and pearls, representing Venice together with various virtues. And other hate figure, figures, the territories under the rule of Venice. Finally, in 1598, there was an apotheosis of women, displaying all sorts of virtues and vices. Mercy, justice, peace, envy, charity, beauty, temper, abundancy, sanctity. And here, uh, 
I put a you know, classical image of that time from actually a, a book about the government of the provinces with a typical representation that you know, was done in the, in the chariot of Venice, the justice with the sword and the balance. Finally, a typical female scene was Venice and as the Virgin Mary that came out in 1513 and 1598. And here, of course, we have to recall a very known study topic of Venetian history, the virginity of Venice, born by the inspiration of God and never conquered. And this is a, a topic that has been studied by David Rosen, Jutta Sperling, and George Tagliaferro, and others. But two other further human elements contributed in trying to give a more devotional character to the state parade. First of all, the putti, the kids. <clears throat> the children masked as angels, as in other parts of Europe, of course, had a great exposition in all Venetian processions and civic rituals of the period. During the corpus Domini processions, in particular, the angels were scattering smelling flowers or rose petals from gold and silver bowls. But they could be assigned many other roles. In 1495, the schools made them carry the emblems of the provinces of Italy and mask as a Saracens. In 1512, they were outfitted with antique robes and as moors, presenting scenes from the Old Testament. In 1513, a very nice trophy on a chariot had four kids faking to peace rose water. And here I found a very interesting iconographical source from Florence at the moment at the British Museum showing a fountain of peasant kids. So I put it here because he recalled me this scene from a Venetian procession. Uh, I think it's been attributed to Parmigianino, Pordenone, or others. In 1517, boys and girls threw razonati, small coins, to the participants, particularly to pilgrims. In the Corpus Christi of 1532, two naked kids acted as Adam and Eve, while in 1585, Fanciulli chanted and played delightful music, accompanied the girl symbolizing the charity, and acted as Solomon, releasing a judgment. And then we have the so-called Dogal kids supporting the trumpets in the procession, as we see here in another detail from Mattia Pagan. I read from, from an article that actually these trumpets that were part of the triumphal insignia of the Doge were pretty happy. And of course, with the presence of the famous Ballottino, the ballot boy, the innocent hand which extracted the ballots during the Dogal election. In Venice, therefore, as elsewhere, the function of the children, particularly the children angels, as the more pristine part of the society, brought a sense of religious purity and innocence to the public scene but also devotion to the values of the community that was defended by them, that were defended by them. During the Holy League of 1571, for instance, Turks and Levantine Hebrews had to hide in a building in Canareggio, afraid for essere lapidati dalle putti, to be stoned by kids. But the kids around the Doge and this sort of thematics have been very much explored by Eisenblick, Eisenbickler, Ottavia Nicoli, and others. But the kids around the Doge also symbolize the support of all ages to the local figure, as well as the transparency of the electoral procedures, essential in a highly electoral system such as the Venetian. And finally, second and last, human elements I would like to mention here, there were the pilgrims, rich and poor, men and women. They were actively involved in the summer processions by the Venetian themselves. They were ordered to attend, receive candles as a gift, were welcomed by the doge and were placed in a prestigious position inside the cortege, as we can see here, sometimes even pair to patricians. 
Indians, however, had their own opinions. They left detailed travelogues of their visits in the lagoons, giving intriguing descriptions of the Venetian rituals from a different perspective than the locals. I'm actually just about publishing an article about this uh, topic. Often, in fact, they release negative judgments of civic rituals, dissatisfied by the unruly behavior and excessive wealth of women, monks, and other social categories. So they are not part, uh, as has been said in the past, uh, of the construction of the myth of Venice, but they were actually pretty much part of the anti-myth of Venice. But let's say uh, so, after seeing this anthropological part uh, that uh, I hope uh, I showed uh, some new thing, let's go to the second part about the cultural, political, and social meanings that were expressed by the many soleri, the chariots shown in Venetian processions, in particular by the Scuola Grande, but not only. They, represented mysteries and figures with the use of both ephemeral artworks and live acts. They received special attention by the government, in particular the powerful Council of Ten. For instance, in May 1513, the secretary Gaspar de la Vedova was ordered to check the letter, the letter, the descriptions in the school's chariots before they use in the square to avoid potential offense to foreign powers. And in September 1598, the heads of the ten approved the chariot of the school of San Theodore only after consulting with the reformers of the University of Padua about their meanings. Let's see a few most important themes that recurred all along our period. The first one, of course, is wealth, abundance, and liberality. I have mentioned the luxury apparel, the nobility, and the monks, and the chariots did not display a different scenario. In 1495, confraternities, monks, and clergy carried a large number of corni di dovizia, cornucopias, symbol of, of abundance. The school of the charity also featured a small, beautiful ship in crystal and a big camel, both bringing wealth a symbol of liberality, sorry, both bringing wheat, a symbol of the liberality granted by the just administration of Venice. In 1511 and 1513, the evangelists and other saints were adorned with jewels and pearls. In 1517 and 1526, boys, girls, and a figure of Venice with a crown of jewels threw coins to the participants. In 1526, came to mountains of, si of silver, recited Venezia plena di vizis, and six huge baskets of silver, one bearing the motto, if the wealth is coming, there is nothing to fear. In 1571, a chariot showed the mint of Venice, a core institution of the wealth and business of the city that I put in photo here, of course. And meanwhile, the grand schools carried chariots of gold and silver as a sign, as the Chronicle tells us, of their support to the Holy League. Again, pyramids of, pyramids of silver appeared in 1585. And in 1598, four chariots presented the theme of abundancy with fruits, wet, and other things wheat and other things. Moreover, the school of Thumb Theodore exposed to cornucopians sprouting gold, gems, gems, flowers, and fruits. True, in 1598, liberty was a popular theme in the life of Venice because of the personal and family celebration of the current doge, Marino Grimani. He continually emphasized his role in helping the mainland and city of Venice during the period of hard famine, for instance, and staged lavish festivals for his wife, the Dogaressa Morosina, Morosini Grimani. But guests might have been impressed by all this demonstration of wealth and abundance. The Japanese monks in 1585, quoting another chronicle, saw so much wealth to consider such a nice order of republic, such a great number of very illustrious father, from the aspect of who you can guess the one only one would suffice to govern the entire world. 
Together with abundance, of course, came peace and justice. In 1495, the confraternity of San Rock presented the figure of justice with a balance in this world, of course, the same figure that was in the front of, uh, head of the Dogal ship, the Busantor, that we see her here in a, a late 16th century representation on the upper right. <clears throat> In 1511, one angel praised the Senate for its justice, which helped bring him victory to the city of Venice. And again in 1571 and 1577, the justice of the prince, the doge, was celebrated by various schools. In 1499 and 1530, justice was even associated to the Venetian patron saint, Saint Mark. Talking about the peace, uh, it appears that in 15, in, in, in 1513 and 1527, uh, he appeared in the form of a small Easter dome with an olive branch. Olive branches were displayed often in state processions, particularly at Easter, but in the 1495 celebration, they were launched to the people. In the moment, the prince and ambassadors exited the basilica. This was, quoting Marin Sanudo, a sign of joy because of the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, as many of you know, was one of the mythical city which uh, Venice was in that period identified. Finally, in 1598, a chariot of the school of St. Mark showed justice and peace kissing accompanied by the motto, Justitia e Pax Osculate Sunt, according to Psalm 84.11 of the Vulgata Latin Bible. Mercy and truth met, justice and peace have kissed. This visual and written rhetor rhetoric could make surface the idea of Venice bringing a new era of peace and justice on earth, the return of Australia. And peace and justice were fundamental, first of all, for the dominion of the most serene republic, also represented in the processions. In 1495, the standard of John II losing on your Cyprus, now the island now in the hands of Venice, was hung together with the standards of general sea captains and providitori di armata, the highest officials of the fleet. This custom that became very common in the following centuries in St. Mark was a visual demonstration of the Venetian dominion at sea. Moreover, in 1585, the Grand School of St. Mark presented women figuring the islands of Candia, of Crete, and other seven islands of the Stato da Mar. But also a real novelty, Lombardy, Treviso, Friuli, Istria, and other provinces of the mainland subject to this lord. Eventually, therefore, even the Lombard and Veneto processions of Venice found a place in the St. Mark processions. But Venice was not just taking care of her dominion, of course. In July 1526, in the time of the dramatic Italian wars, when honoring the Liga Cognac, the monk of Sir Stefan presented a chariot bearing, bearing the script, Italy was stripped by the lion, Venice came and freed her. After the secular themes about virtues and politics, let's consider the religious features of the ob objects carried in the St. Mark procession. Keeping in mind that it is impossible in pre-modern Venice, as Ed Muir has written, to operate a rigid distinction between the sacred and profane. First of all, and here I put a, a very nice image of the Fede um, by, by uh, Mattia, Mattia Pagan uh, that actually has a shop uh, exactly at the, at the Bottega della Fede. First of all, saints, relics, and sacred objects of all sorts appeared in great number. As each school, church, and convent was extremely proud in exhibiting its own relics and objects as a sign of identity and competition with the peers. Even the chapter of St. Mark brought around the square some of its most famous objects from the Basilica's treasure. In 1511 and 15, uh, 
1511, 15, I just want to brought a couple of examples of this. The Dominican monks, uh, St. John and Paul, exposed a big head in silver of St. Ursula, recently arrived from Fiume in Istria and donated by the Senate to, quote, her church and school, in particular to the little school of St. Ursula, who was attached to the attached to the to the the, the convent uh, of uh, of Saint John and Paul and uh, had been decorated as we all know just uh, 15 years before by the spectacular cycle devoted to the legend of Saint Ursula by the Vittore Carpaccio. While at the same time, the school of Saint Mark displayed in 1585 a ring that, according to a 13th century legend, was received by a fisherman who rescued Saint Mark, Saint George, and Saint Nicholas in the lagoon. The ring was later donated to the Doge and was a particularly important thing that we saw he represented by Paris Bourdon in the major council of the Ducal Palace. A chronicle of 1585 profited of the occasion to recount the entire story of the fisher in form of propaganda because, quote, perhaps many, and especially foreigners, did not know about it. Talking about religious messages, let's see the role of the Holy Scriptures. Since in 1495, the School of the Charity had the Fakim, the porters addressed as David and Abigail, since from the Old and New Testaments were almost always present. Obviously, presenting the Old and New Testament was something that was adopted from the medieval Sacre Rappresentazioni, the pre modern street form of theater so popular in Venice and everywhere in Europe at the time. In the following decade, and here we, I, I brought uh, two recently statues, uh, really. Uh, um, restored by Save Venice, so one in San Francisco de la Vigna and, and the other in San Marziali. One is a Christ, a typical, you know, 15, early 15th century Christ who had the possibility of a mechanism in his mouth uh, to throw out smoke and so to give sort of an alive presentation during the sacred presentation. And uh, here on the right, uh, uh, Virgin Mary with uh, with uh, her child, uh, the, the little early apparently belonging to the 14th century already, which in my opinion might recall the status uh, of the Maria, the famous festival of the Maria, uh, late medieval festivals, uh, a medieval festival of Venice that was actually stopped uh, at the end of the 14th, uh, 15th, uh, 14th century. So after 1495, uh, in the following decades, uh, a very popular subject in the, in the Sun Mark procession were Adams and Eve, Noah and the Deluge, <clears throat> Joshua, Abraham and the prophets, uh, David and Goliath, uh, Solomon, uh, the Babel Tower, the Three Magi, moments of the life of Christ and the Virgin, the universal judgment, and the paradise and hell. I will just make the case here of Moses, the successful figure throughout our period. In the procession of September 1515, for example, came out the 12 tribes with the verga, the staff of Aaron as his younger brother Moses, while in 1517, it was the turn of the 10 commandments given to the Israelites by Moses. Moses was then particularly successful in the last part of the century. In 1585, an elaborate chariot figured him giving the laws to his people and after the complaint of the Hebrew in the desert, hitting the stone from which, quoting from a report of the procession, the most perf perfect waters arose. In 1598, the same scene was represented together with the motto Ad Aquam Contradictionis, taken from the Book of Numbers 2013. Here, once again, and here, of course, I brought you two very famous uh, images uh, of, uh, of the scene uh, of the, the spreading of water by Moses, uh, by Tintoretto, and by Leandro Bassani, who was actually a painter of the late 16th century under the patronage of the Doge Marino Grimani. 
Here, once again, we might recall the particular period of the Doge Marino Grimani, once again. But more in general, for the Republic, Moses signified the support of God to his people, as well as just love, generosity, and abundance. Also, the theme of water was fundamental, of course, being the natural element that gave life and protection to Venice since her foundation. So far, we had seen a pretty a pretty much traditional picture, if we want, a sort of late medieval picture of the culture expressed by the Venetian parades. But in this last section, I would like to try, in the spirit of Abi Warburg, to inquire for possible sign of the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, in particular insights from the Ritorno all'Antico. The sight of the kind are not much in Venetian processions, though. In 1512, the monks of St. John and Paul presented a spoglia, a booty of arms in the antique fashion, as written by Saludo without further explanation. Then we jump to the celebration for the Holy League in 1571, when Neptune showed on seahorse to on, on sea horses together with Mars, both devoted to destroy the Turk, of course. Neptune and Mars were very popular in Venetian culture since at least the 1550s. And here we see the, the most uh, famous uh, statues uh, of Mars and Neptune representing the dominion of Venice uh, at, the, at, the, at the, the end uh, of the Scala dei Giganti in the Ducal Palace and another very famous representation by Paolo Veronese. But uh, Neptune in particular appeared again in 1598 on a, in, a, in the parade of 1598 on a beautiful sea chariot carried by two fake fishes. And this was just one year after his protagonism in the ephemeral architectures and boats set by the Doge Marino Grimani's team of artists and artisans in, once again, in honor of the Dogaressa, the wife, Morosini. And here we see uh, first, uh, the representation of Neptune since the uh, from the print of uh, the uh, the 1570 procession, and then we see uh, uh, one uh, iconographical example from the the celebration for Morosini, in which we see twice, uh, uh, of course, uh, Neptune here and up here, and then actually I think that uh, Neptune is also represented here in the early 17th century, in the early 17th century procession by Giacomo Franco. Another suggestion in this direction, it might come from the exhibition of the Mondo, the world. In 1495, the school of St. John the Evangelist carried a chariot with the Mondo in paper, perhaps a map mond, signifying the league against France. Then the theme of the world had a great success in Venetian processions in the 16th century in 1511, 1515, 1526, with religious and political overtones. <clears throat> Later in 1571, God, God appeared dominating the world coming out from the clouds, with the kings of France and Spain kneeling in front of him. Then a young boy came playing a war trumpet on a word, while another Palla del Mondo Grande was surrounded by four furries from hell, signifying the fury of war, fury of war. Interesting what happened also in 1598, when the school of San Theodore presented a grand woman figuring the Machina del Mondo, the machine of the world. The woman had a crown with celestial planets, then rays of fire as hairs signifying the fire. The clouds in her chest signifying air, waves of color as for water, and castle and cities for earth. The promoter of the chariot was seeking the establishment of a relation between the cosmos and the terrestrial world and its passions and virtues under the surveillance of God. But also, and perhaps I'm sorry, I'm over-interpreting here, we might see a certain parallel of this machina del mondo 
with the astrological passion in Venetian festivals, recently alighted both by the planets in sugar offered in 1574 to Henry of Valois and the 12 statues of the Zodiac in the theater of the world in the Teatro del Mondo built for the Dogaresa Morosini in 1597, once again, just one year before. The aquatic theater show of the world in general were very popular since the 1520s in Venice. And we see here on the right, a very famous representation of, of a theater of the world, of an aquatic theater of the world by Cesare Vecellio. And they could echo suggestions from Vitruvius as Enrica Benini Clementi has explained. I think we are pretty much in time and I would like uh, to thank you again, uh, Karate, and, uh, and to thank Subarbo for this wonderful occasion, occasion uh, for everybody of you participating tonight. I want to do a conclusion about Venice that perhaps uh, could be considered also for other contexts as well. We have seen that the model of the Venetian state procession set in 1495 was exposed over and over again from the dark age of the Italian wars, the ruin of Italy, as Wicciardini said, to the fight for a new international acknowledgement of the Republic in the sunset of the Renaissance arrived in 1600. The Venetian triumphal state parade in St. Mark, designed by the, government, by the government and intellectuals such as Giovanni Luigi Collini, aim at exposing all age, ages and social classes, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the religious and the laymen. They would march all together in the political and sacral hurt heart of the city, displaying the prosperity, good government, religiosity and union of this new Jerusalem, and could join and could join her to bring wealth, justice and peace to the dominion and the entire world under the protections and guidance of God. Nice intentions indeed. In reality, as we have seen, only certain sectors of the society had, had their representation, giving an analytic view of the Venetian society at the end, dominated by the religious, political, and social ruling classes. Conflicts and disloyalty, competition for presence and prestige happened regularly. For the elites, being part of the secret ritual in the heart of the city was a real thing, a fundamental step in the strategy for social identity and religious recognition. Moreover, the devotional spirit of the procession was highly questioned, as we have seen in particular by foreign observers such as the pilgrims. Wealth was dominating, while the symbols of the solar remained pretty much static mostly repeating old standards from the Holy Scriptures or the civic rhetoric. At least until the late 16th century, novelties from the Ritorno all'antica promoted by humanism and welcome in other sectors of the Venetian culture, such as art, architecture, and theater, were rarely introduced. At the end, observing the wealth, emotion, and intensity of the public theater of Venice will indeed continue to help us both scrutinize the peculiar construction of a religious and spectacular majesty of the Civitas Sancti Marci, as well as her real developments, changes and contradictions, risking to unveil the elite's attempts to construct an idolized urban image. So the debate of a supposed hiatus between a mythical approach to the political and social structure of Venice on one hand, and on the other, the reality be behind that myth, debate that's still going on in Venetian historiography, could actually be abandoned, in my opinion, is actually pretty obsolete. It seems the contemporaries did not look at things in that way. Instead, looking closer and closer at their attempts to build a perfect image of the most Serene Republic through civic festival might help us to understand at the same time the cracks in that image and in her political culture, social body, ritual system, and gender discourse. Thank you. <laughs>